Hi there, Michael McQueen here and welcome to this Meet the Experts series and I'm loving these conversations where I get the chance to uh, pick the brain of some of the people who've most profoundly informed my thinking um, for this latest book called Mind Stuck. And I'm so excited today to have the chance to chat with Dr. Paul Zak. And um, I've been following Paul's work for, gosh, I reckon six or seven years very closely. And it is funny when you have these moments where it's someone that you've You've read their books and you follow their work and you get a chance to just meet them and they're just like you hope they would be. And so firstly, thank you so much, Paul, for just um, your kindness, your generosity, just being willing to engage and have a chat today. And um, I'm really looking forward to getting a sense of what you've been working on lately and also just where your thinking is at now. We're in a very interesting time in world history when it comes to political polarization. How do we build bonds that work as human beings? So look, thank you so much and um, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for having me. Um, before we jump in, I think I might read a bit of a bio for people who maybe have heard your name but don't know a lot about you. There's a lot to you. You've done a lot over the years. Um, so I've just got a little bio here. I think I wanted to read it because I don't want to miss any of this. There's a lot of a lot of gold here. So Dr. Paul Zak is a distinguished neuroeconomist, which in itself is such an interesting term, and I want to unpack that a bit. I'm renowned for his pioneering work in exploring the connections between human behavior and economics. I'm holding a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Zach's research is focused on the role of oxytocin in shaping trust and social interactions. Um, you've written a number of best-selling books, um, many of which I've referenced heavily over the years, The Moral Molecule, The Trust Factor, and most recently, and I love this title, Immersion, The Science of the Extraordinary and the Source of Happiness. So I can't wait to hear a little bit about that book, but I wanted to dive into some of the work you've been doing over many years now around how to build sort of meaningful and trusting bonds between humans. And I mean, the scope of my next book is around how do you shift stubborn people? What is that role of oxytocin and trust um, neurochemically and neurobiologically in terms of actually influencing people to change their minds? Oh, it's such a great question. So oxytocin, we discovered about 20 years ago, appears to be um, a key signaling molecule in the brain that says this person in front of me, this group of individuals appear to be safe or trustworthy. I'm comfortable around them. What's interesting about oxytocin or a couple of things are interesting. One is it kind of indexes the strength of a relationship. So Michael, you're perfectly wonderful. If we hang out, I would love to have a beer with you someday. But if my daughter comes in, I'll release more oxytocin than when I see you. So, yeah. um, right. So that's interesting from a from an application perspective. It means I can use this technology, or I can measure oxytocin using a technology and get a sense of the strength of social connections. And as social creatures, we do this very naturally with strangers, with work colleagues. We form relationships. Um, whether we want to call them that or not, physiologically, we do this all the time with dogs, with with you know pet hamsters. Um, that's the first, and then the second is that the system is tunable, and this is I think where it applies so much to organizations. It can be tuned up or tuned down, so we naturally want to connect to others, but I can create an environment in which that is inhibited. For example, a work environment with low psychological safety, that stress response of the friction that I'm uh, you know, living in uh, in this low psychological safety workplace inhibits the ability physiologically to me for me to work effectively with other people. And therefore, there's a, a real drag on that. On the other hand, you and I have both been to many workplaces where you walk in, people are connected, they're happy, they're working together. There's like a, you know, this jazz quartet, they're just digging it. And you're like, oh man, this place rocks. Like these people, they have formed this kind of super organism and they're able to perform at their best. And by the way, get the satisfaction from that. So when we have these strong, strong social relationships, it's actually neurologically valuable to the brain and we want to continue to do this. And that, that's what I love about your research is it put to me language around something that we all intuitively sense. Like, you know, when you, you know you meet with someone, maybe it's a new client or a new colleague and you know, like you walk away from the conversation. There's that sense that I just, I clicked with that person and I never really understood the, the, the mechanics of why that happens or why it doesn't happen. You know, you can speak to someone who they're saying all the right things, but there's that lack of authenticity and therefore you don't quite click with that individual and just understanding what's going on there. I, I thought some of your work was so valuable in understanding why communication and relationships work sometimes and why they don't. Even when we're doing all the right things, 
but something actually deeply unconscious doesn't quite click. What I was really curious about is in the last few years, of course, we've done so much of this, you know, so much of you know, Zooming and Microsoft Teams calls and people working in hybrid and remote environments. Does that release of oxytocin work the same way when you're going through a digital filter like this? Or does it require that sort of face-to-face, gut-to-gut connection? Mm -hmm. Great question. So we actually were exploring this pre-COVID, which is interesting. And um, what we found is that this uh, kind of social emotional connection is variable. So we find on average for this kind of 2D uh, screen world, we get about two thirds of the interaction or the benefit of that neurologically as we do in person. So in person, I'm getting a lot more bandwidth hitting my brain getting smell, I'm maybe getting touch, I'm getting all this other information. I'm getting probably a, a better sense of the emotional state you're in from your seeing, you know, the close-up of your face as I see you in person. But the screen's not bad. And the evidence for that is something that, of course, you and I have never done, but I've heard that people do, which is people crying in movies. What's that about? Right. Yep. So you're at a movie, you're cognitively yep. intact. You know, this is a, a fictional story. And at the end of the movie, when the boy gets the girl or whatever, people cry. That's neurologically very interesting. It shows us how sensitive we are to social information, even when that information comes from a flickering image on a screen. How interesting. I, um, I really like some of the research I came across, and I think this was in the moral molecule, where you talked about the value of synchronizing behavior. And then there's something that happens when we synchronize our actions or activities and even body language with another person that can release oxytocin, but is actually a really key tool or technique for building affinity and getting people on board, you know, with a new idea or with a new perspective. Um, can you just unpack that a bit? Like, how does that work practically, that, that building or synchronizing of our activities with another human being? Right. So you mentioned earlier, you know, kind of meeting someone, uh, maybe a client, and you just kind of click with them. So we see when that happens is there's uh, physical mimicry. We, we begin to kind of smile at the same time, gesture in the same ways. We also see neurophysiologic synchrony. That is, brains begin to synchronize. I'll give you a concrete example of that in a second. And so if I want to facilitate that, then there are lots of ways to do it. How do I convince you that I'm your friend or I want to hang out with you? So I'm really famous for um, telling people that I hug everybody instead of shaking hands. So who do you hug? people you like, people you know. And so that's that's a hack, right? So the other thing is just movement. So we could go on a walk, we could, uh, you know, uh, dance together, we could sing together, Any anything we do together, soldiers marching together, their their physiology is synchronized. So think of this kind of as a, as a physical way to induce that emotional connection. So here's the concrete example. Recently, we discovered this will be in a scientific journal soon, that if we measure neurologic immersion, so immersion is the neurologic value that the brain gets from social interaction. So it's driven by both oxytocin and dopamine. Neurologic immersion, which we measure every second with some technology. Uh, in the salespeople in a luxury retail store, strongly predict with 85% with accuracy which customers purchase. Now, why would that be the case? Because we're synchronizing our emotions. We socially, emotionally regulate. So if that customer is having a great time, the salesperson's having a great time, and vice versa. And not only you know, can we predict who buys, but there was a linear relationship. The more immersed that salesperson was, the more money the customer sent, spent. Oh, so therefore, this notion of creating extraordinary CX is really important. But as you said earlier, it's got to be authentic. I have to really like love customer service. So I was just, just on a 24-hour flight back home from Cape Town, South Africa. So, you know, almost as far away as I can get uh, <laughs> yeah. near, near near your latitude. And um right. What happened? I was in business class, extraordinary experiences. Shout out to United Airlines. Just beautiful. The people smile every time, you know, this is a long, damn long flight, right? And everyone gets tired. These flight hands are working. And this guy who was in my aisle, he would always smile. How are you, Mr. Zach? So nice to see you. Can I refresh that drink for you? I mean, he he loved his job and it made me so happy. You know, you're tired, you're trying to sleep. It was someone who authentically was in the right position and it made my experience so much better. I love that. And something you just mentioned there, I've never actually thought of and come across this, but the, the value of physicality and how that can facilitate good relationships. I'm thinking like you mentioned going for a walk. I mean, what a simple but useful idea. Like if you've got one of those tense situations and I'm thinking right now of, you know, clients and colleagues who've you know got to go into a difficult conversation with a staff member or a superior or even a colleague of theirs and they're trying to diffuse a difficult situation rather than sitting opposite each other at a cafe 
or in a boardroom or at a desk, go for a walk. Like the value of actually being side by side and physically, even if you're not synchronizing your steps military style, just moving together, that can right. actually make quite a difference in terms of how open people will be to communicating openly and hopefully changing their minds. Is that, is, did I understand that correctly? Because that's really simple but powerful. Yeah, exactly. And also you burn up a little of that tension as well. So um, like you, I speak a lot on stage. And what I always do is I run out to the stage. First of all, I want to put energy into the audience, but yeah. also I'm always a little nervous, right? And so I'm going to yeah. burn off some of that energy. And they're like, what the hell is this? I'm huge. I'm six foot four. So it's some giant dude running on the stage, like what the hell's going on here? So all of a sudden now I've shaken you out of your sitting in your butt and getting tired on the chair. And something has changed. So as, as something as small as that, right, just kind of injecting energy into that and letting people share that energy, but also yeah. get rid of all that weird tension we have from just sitting on our butts. I love that. Any tips you've got? So, you know, when you're in this situation, you're chatting with someone and you're just not clicking. The oxytocin is not flowing. Um, and mm -hmm. you get that sense that like the harder I press, we're just on a different wavelength here. Do you just like just cut and run? Do you like this? Uh, we need to approach this on another day in another way, or are there things sort of midstream of conversation that you found useful from a research perspective can be helpful at trying to create that connection where you feel like you're missing each other? Because we've all had that experience, and it's it's sort of tricky when you feel like like you just call it out, or do you mm -hmm. sort of try and organically um, do something to make things start to click more? Yeah, I think. Um... Yes, and right. So um, if it's really not going well, go. You know. Uh, Seems like this is not a good day. You know, when we reconnect, what I've done often, Michael, is to call out the emotion that I see. Like, gosh, you look like you're you're having stressed out today. Like, maybe this is not the right time, right? So, um, you know, are are you doing okay? Is you know what's going on? And for me, I, I'm I'm a bit of a Martian. I am totally fascinated by the human species. I find them really interesting and weird. Yeah. And so, for some reason. I have the ability, and maybe others do like you, to just ask about their emotional state. So I was just on a Zoom before we spoke, and I saw a guy who I saw, I don't know, six months ago, he was stressed out. And he looks so happy today. I'm like, his name is David. I'm like, David, what what happened in your life? You know, you're falling in yeah. love. You're, you know, whatever, what, you know. And so all of a sudden, now the conversation becomes very warm, very um, emotional. So I think sometimes we think in business that there's a business me and I must speak in a certain way and yeah. no, but just be yourself and be relaxed. You, you mentioned the word authenticity and I think that's the key. And so um, let those emotions out. And again, because they're contagious, like, man, I'd really like to talk to you today, but it's, it's, it's okay. It, it seems like this is not a good time for you. You're distracted or, um, you know, uh, I think it's okay to say that. And by the way, if the person doesn't like what you said, like, what are you talking about how I look? I'm like, <laughs> Then, then you walk away, right? Like, okay, <laughs> this is not really happening. Yeah. Um, by the way, I love this. I call it the switcheroo in sales, which is, yeah. I can't talk to this guy. I don't know why, but I'll switch it out and have one of my teammates, um, you know, two weeks from now, contact that person and go, hey, I know you talked to Paul a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, we just want to make sure that we're really providing the service that you need. And my name's Beth and I'm going to do this. And, and sometimes that's all it takes is just kind of switching out who you're talking to. I love that. That's perfect. I mean, in terms of some of the latest stuff you've been doing, and I've been watching what you've been posting over the last few months on LinkedIn, and there's some really interesting stuff around this intersection of creativity and technology and AI. Did you want to unpack that a bit, particularly from a music perspective? I found that so interesting because, I mean, you're doing some really cool work right now, I think, from my perspective. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think what we're doing is, um, you know, creating technologies that allow people or allow businesses to measure people's emotional responses to experiences and therefore use that information to create better experiences, right? So we, we all agree. We want extraordinary experiences. We want great CX. We want great UX. We want all the Xs to be great. Um, <laughs> yeah. But how do we know? So we had worked with a streaming service um, which said, hey, we're, we're drowning in new music and we, and we don't really know how to slice it. We have sort of people ask, we ask people, you know, what they think is going to be a good song or not. And most of the time they're wrong. Um, and so I said, great, I, I, you know, let's send us a bunch of new songs. And then three months later, tell us how many downloads and, you know, additions to playlists and all that happened. So what we found is that this neurologic measure immersion, this evaluation mechanism for social emotional experiences, not only predicted uh, which songs would be hits, when you apply machine learning to these data, we're at 97% accuracy three months in advance. So why would that be the case? 
the brain is very stingy with this energy flow, right? I, it takes a lot of energy to run, maybe 20% of your caloric intake for this 2% of your body weight. So when we see this neurologic state of called immersion, this valuation mechanism for social emotional experiences, it's really a big metabolic cost. The brain goes, wow, I dig this. And what's interesting is I dig this, that's out of the brainstem. Your, your conscious uh, brain doesn't know this. And we ask people, you like this song, would you listen to it again? Would you share it? Zero predictive ability in the conscious realm. So really getting into this unconscious emotional response and then having technology that captures this will allow music distributors to decide where to put their marketing money, will help young artists in particular create better music, who will develop an audience. This is a real tool that's available to individuals because now we're able easily, anybody in real time, to capture what the brain loves. It's so interesting. I think this, this intersection, hey, between using technology to help us understand ourselves as humans better and be better versions of ourselves, that's I and mean, that's what gets me excited because there's a lot of technology that feels like it's a pushback. It's trying to remove the human from the equation or make things so automated. That there's none of that sense, that zest, that soul that humans bring into life. And I love, I love that idea of how do we use AI and technology to actually make us more human. That, that to me is, that's exciting. And I think it's a really positive step. So um, that's very cool. So um, we've only got a couple of moments to go, but I'd love to give people a chance to follow your work. Um, I mean, obviously LinkedIn, I, a lot of what you post on LinkedIn, I've found incredibly interesting over the last few months in particular. Where else can people find you and your work or connect with you? Um, thanks, Michael. So uh, easiest to find me at getimmersion.com, immersion with an I, like you're being immersed. Oh, there's a title page. Uh, and so, um, and also we have a free emotional fitness app that anybody can use. It's in the app store. Uh, it's called uh, Tuesday so that you have the best Tuesday ever. Uh, and you go to the Apple app store and download it for free. And I'm measuring my own emotional state right now. And that smile says I'm getting more value from this conversation with you, Michael, <laughs> than I am at baseline. And my That's background is false. I'm a little bit stressed because, you know, I'm talking to you. I have to put energy in. Oh, I'm a little <laughs> frowny now. I'm a little below baseline. What the heck's going on here? So um, it's really exciting to look at, you know, real time. Here's my time series of my emotional connection. And there are goals so that people can build up emotional fitness by facilitating the connections that we all need to stay emotionally healthy. So this is like the modern day mood ring. Is that what the app is? Do you remember the mood ring? The <laughs> kind of, yeah. It's capturing getting this neurologic state immersion. And in yep. published research, we've shown that when you're below threshold yep. for two days or more, that your mood drops, your energy drops, you're getting these pre-depression uh, pre depression indicators and therefore, the goal here is to have people intervene on their own or with their family or with the clinicians so that before you have a crisis, before your mood is you know, going from bad to depression, um, before your anxiety takes over, use some resiliency resources, call on your friends, call on your family, and help yourself bounce out of those low mood states. Right. Well, look, thank you so much for just the, the caliber of your work over so many years, the difference it's made. And thank you for making the time to to have a chat today. I really appreciate it. You know, I'm a huge fan of yours, Michael. So it's been a pleasure.